Software Engineering Radio Episode 55, Refactoring Part 2. Hello listeners, thanks for joining Software Engineering Radio once again. In this episode, Eberhard and Martin will continue their discussion about refactoring. They're going to talk specifically about large or bigger refactorings in this episode. Sorry for the somewhat not so great sound quality. We had to do some uh, post-processing of the recording because of uh, noise that was on the recording. And you can hear some of the artifacts. It's very well understandable, but it's not perfect. So uh, have fun listening. The obvious question is, uh, what is the difference between a small and a big refactoring? <laughs> I think um, the, the the main difference between the small refactoring and the big refactoring, I think it, it's 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 difficult to to formalize or it's difficult to to just say one one sentence about what is the difference. Um, in my experience, um, in, in the past projects I was involved in, we observed just some situations where we need to to do um, maybe even a small refactoring, but that involves uh, a lot of parts in the system and that maybe goes really into the kernel of the system. And we need, um, we, we cannot, fi we, 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 we were not able to finish this refactoring in, in an hour or in a day. We just need some weeks and months to, to really uh, complete this refactoring. And I would say this, this was a, a large refactoring or a big refactoring. Um, but I cannot say, okay, if, if you have uh, more than five classes involved, it's a big refactoring or not. Um, maybe it's, it just depends on how, how much time do you need to implement the refactoring and how many pieces of your system are affected by that uh, that refactoring. Um, I think that's that's the, the, the main difference. And there, there are a lot of additional questions coming up if you if you think about large refactorings, because if you do a refactoring for for several weeks or several months maybe even um there are a lot of questions uh, coming up like uh how do you integrate small steps and do are you doing the refactoring small steps or are you doing refactoring in, in parallel and branches and stuff like that so a lot of interesting questions coming up with these kind of factorings and they are typically more um more complicated to to do than these kind of small refactorings which uh, which each ref each developer can just do it um, with the IDE during the normal development. Okay, so um, basically what you're saying is uh, the difference is in uh, the time that it takes to actually do the refactoring. So um, what is it that, that actually make those um, refactorings appear? Because uh, especially if you do refactoring all the time anyway, uh, mm -hmm. You shouldn't have such gigantic problems in your code that mm -hmm. uh, make you, um, yeah, well, um, refactor the code for mm -hmm. uh, such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I think you can you can you can try to avoid big refactorings uh, by doing small refactorings all the time, mm -hmm. and you should you really should do this, doing all the small refactorings all the time. Um, but I think, and and that, that's my experience, that you can come into some situations um, where um, you have you have refactored your system all the time, but where you observed, oh, I, I, I have misunderstood some domain concept significantly, uh, or I, I forgot to, to, to think about a specific domain concept in the beginning, or it, maybe you just learn, uh, learn more stuff over time, and, and if this, uh, if you are learning, or if if, if this uh, additional knowledge that you gain over time, uh, maybe affect um, a central part of your system, uh, it might be necessary to to change the central part of your system. And if you have a lot of dependencies on the central part of your system, it it might not be even so 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 easy to just say, okay, I, I rename this class. It's, it's it's just a simple refactoring. It's, it's easy to do in in five minutes, but if you need to change, for example, maybe an, an inheritance hierarchy in the, in the central part of your system because you've learned that this inheritance hierarchy is just just bad or just uh, not the right structure, um, 
and you have learned it after you 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 built a huge part of the system because you have now a different point of view or new aspects coming into the system you can just find yourself in this situation where you need we need to adapt a lot of parts in the system and um i think you 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 will not be able to do it in a, in a day or in two days um and then you're you're in this situation maybe it's it's not so often if you do these small refactorings all the time and you can avoid large refactorings uh, mostly by doing all the small refactorings all the time but i think you cannot really um be sure that you will never get into the situation of uh having such a problem where you need a larger refactoring okay so um how do i actually do that i mean uh, changing uh, a central part of the system um because do i just say okay so i'm going to stop for the next month clean this mess up and then i'm going to continue the real development of uh, additional functionality yeah that's that's one one that, that's really one approach of okay. doing 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 larger refactoring is just stop the normal development to refactoring and then continue with the normal uh, normal development of your system but it's um it's difficult if you have a large team and you have a lot of stuff to implement so you cannot say to 20 people we stop because maybe it's it's not possible to to refactor the central part with 20 people in parallel uh, so maybe uh, maybe two or three people can can do the real refactoring and to can implement the real refactoring and what should the others the other 17 people do should do in, in that piece of time they can do uh, holidays or whatever but maybe it's, it's it's not possible in some situations and in the typical agile Uh, development methods or development uh, ways of programming um, the idea is um, to do even the, the larger refactoring step by step doing a lot of small refactorings um, but that needs just additional thoughts about this refactoring how to split up a large refactoring to small refactorings is not for, for, for many of these larger refactorings is not obvious um, how to, to split it into it's not trivial I'll just split them into small effects and small steps. And in, in some situations, you can cannot even think about what should I do after I've implemented these five steps? What What is the sixth or seventh step um, for the refactoring? So it's, it's really complicated to foresee all these small steps for a large refactoring. And um, if you're in, in, in such a situation, you can just start with the, with the first steps and with the first, first thoughts. And then moving forward somehow, and then it's it's interesting uh, when you integrate your changes into the the common uh, code repository, because if you if you commit your changes back into the code repository, and typically in, in many agile development methods you do it all the time, after each hour or minute even, um, those changes become visible to the rest of the team, and then you need to communicate somehow inside the team why uh, do you change what piece of code what is the refactoring about where does the refactoring moves moves to uh, was the target of the refactoring was the target design um, so that all the team members are aware of these um, refactoring uh, so that they know why is this method deprecated and why are these parts of the system changed because they are changed with small refactorings maybe, but maybe the, the overall design is not getting better because you maybe first need to move some step forward and then you can really um, finish the large refactoring or finish a, a part of this large refactoring um, with improving the design. So it's simply if you, a simple, very, very simple example for this is uh, if you rename a method um, without a refactoring tool so typically first you you add an additional method with a new name and then you forward from the old method to the new method and then you remove the old method and if you commit all these different steps back into the version control you in the in the middle of the refactoring the design is 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 worse than before because you have two methods with the same behavior and uh, different names and nobody knows why are there two different methods with different names and stuff like that so it's uh, it's it's really get worse in the middle of the refactoring before it gets better um so it's it's really on this simple small example it it, it doesn't matter because uh, you can you can fix it in the next hour and that's it and nobody will notice even but if you do a large refactoring those changes 
gets visible to the team and and, and people gets um, gets nervous and 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 somehow um, they they don't know what what to do with these uh, with these um, intermediate design steps. So it's really important, I think, to communicate the refactoring inside the team and to uh, to get a, an overall impression uh, what the refactoring is about. Okay, so but but it's not recommended to come up with a complete strategy for doing the whole refactoring. Instead, you you say that you just do a, for a few steps and then you plan the next few steps and go step by step more or less. I think it's 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 it's, it's a it's a good idea to have an overall idea of uh, what the the main steps are to accomplish the refactoring or to 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 accomplish the, or to improve the design in in the uh, in the way you would like to get it improved um but the real fine real small steps while doing the refactoring i think it's not possible to foresee them all um up front so you, even if you even if you if you think you can you can foresee them uh, i'm pretty sure that you will learn while doing the refactoring that some of these steps are just stupid or that they need to be executed in a different order yeah. and stuff like that so you need to adapt and then change your your let's say your factoring plan or your factoring idea uh, all the time while doing the refactoring and it, it's not bad it's, it's it's good because you learn about the refactoring and you learn how to more efficiently do the refactoring and and uh, what difficulties may occur and yeah so it's it's basically uh, much like a big design up front so you are not doing a, a big design of the refactoring itself up front, but instead you just say, okay, I'm going to do it the agile way and, and learn while while I go. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. So um, um, how do I do that with my versioning system? I mean, um, should I do a branch? What do I do if I have a, pessim uh, a versioning system that uses pessimistic locking, mm -hmm. where I have to check out each file that I'm going to change, mm -hmm. and if this this refactoring is uh, is um, affecting almost in everything in the versioning system, that might be a big nightmare to check out everything. So, so what mm -hmm. do I do? How do I how do I deal with that? I think um, at one point is. Um, why should why should I check in some changes into the version control for 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 refactoring? Because I do maybe continuous integration. Yeah. So I would like to to, to I would like that the other team members are are benefiting from from the changes all the time that I adapt their code to the new changes and stuff like that. Um, and if you if you do such a large refactoring in parallel to the normal development on on the on the main main code stream of the version control. Um, it's it's quite difficult to to step back into the uh, from the refactoring. It's quite difficult if you're saying, okay, I, I will do these small steps to the large refactoring and do some more steps and some more steps and some other people are checking in some new features and stuff like that. It's all all intertwined somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, if you then find yourself in a situation where you think, oh, mm, that was the wrong direction for the, for the large refactoring, and that that happens. In the real world, um, and then you really would like to step back, just to to uh, reverse your changes for the refactoring, but only those changes for the refactoring, of course, not the changes that that other team members are have integrated into the version control, and that's that gets really difficult if you have just if you are all working with the refactoring and the normal development on the same stream, um, and for such situations, I think it's it's beneficial to work. On a branch uh, while doing the the larger refactoring, but um, if I say working on a branch for larger refactoring, I do not mean to work for the next two or three months on the branch, and then after you've completed the complete the, the whole refactoring, then merge it back into the head. I think of um, going in in small branch steps, think like that. So doing some small steps in the branch and then merge the branch back into the head if you if, if you're sure that those changes are are good and, and and beneficial for the system and then um moving on again in the branch with the refactoring doing some small steps uh with the refactoring in the branch and then merge the branch back so that you uh, merge the branch back into the mainstream into, into the head um frequently 
So because it's 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 really it's gets it gets a nightmare if you if you have a branch for three months or whatever, maybe changing your central inheritance hierarchy or whatever in your system and you need to merge it back after three months into the into the head, it's just it's it's a real nightmare. You cannot you cannot really do it. So basically I, I would just plan some steps ahead. Yeah. And then I do a branch. Yeah. Then I work on those steps and if some of the steps are rather not such good ideas then I just go back those steps and uh, yeah, then I have some, some defined state and then I yeah. merge the branch back into the main line and yeah. uh, continue with uh, the yeah. next branch for the next few steps of my refactoring. Yeah, I think it's, it's a nice idea. We, okay. call, we call those points uh, uh, often uh, safe points. Oh, okay. Kind of a safe point where you merge it back and you'll you be, you be somewhat safe. That it's, it's, it's a good state of, the, of your refactoring to merge it back into the, and, and into the head and your at this kind of safe point and then you move on mm, okay so is there any kind of, uh, sort of literature or um, or established uh, patterns about that um i think that there are no established patterns um about larger refactorings or about bigger refactoring problems um a colleague of mine stefan rook uh, he wrote a book about large refactorings and uh, together with me mm. and and we we try to collect some some typical problems some typical patterns some typical behaviors in agile teams um how you can deal with these kind of like let's say the safe points or branches and and other team techniques mostly team techniques less technical techniques more team techniques how to deal in an agile team with these kind of large refactorings it's called um large refactorings uh, restructuring comp doing complex restructuring successfully or something like that mm -hmm. I'm more familiar with the German title, not with the English one, but there, yeah. there is an English version of the book out. Uh, it's published in, by by Wiley, mm -hmm. so I think you can you will find it if you take a look for if, if you search for refactoring. And but I, I do not, I, I don't know any other literature or papers about large refactoring. So I think that there are other difficult refactoring situations um, where uh, nice books are out. For example. If you take a look at um, what happens if you have a database connection oh. or if you have an object relational mapping in your system and you would like to refactor, for example, your database structure or if you would like to refactor your domain model and that needs to, uh, to or that, that, that results in modifying somehow the object relational mapping and how you can do refactoring small steps of that. And there, there's a nice book out written by Scott Ambler and, and, and a colleague of colleague of him. Uh, I forgot the name. Agile database techniques. Um I think it's it's somehow called about database refactorings or okay. it's 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 published in the in the signature series by Edison Wesley in the Martin Fowler signature series. So 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 what do I actually do with databases? I mean, uh, obviously the problem is that I have this database in production and there is a lot of data in there. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I change the schema, I have this problem that I have existing data that I somehow have to uh, change and, and migrate. So what do I do about that? Um, interestingly... Even if it's if it's a if it's a completely different approach that has nothing to do with objects or with inheritance or whatever, uh, you can find pretty similar patterns um, that you can apply for 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 object relational mappings or relational schemas on the database. Um, how to refactor them, for example, if you have um, if you have uh, if you would like to split. Um, if you would like to split some 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 definitions, some some attribute in your class, and you need to adapt your chain, uh, your schema, you can even adapt your schema step by step by, for example, like these rename method refactoring, uh, add an additional um, column, and um, somehow deprecate an old column somehow, even if, if it's not available in database uh, systems, it's kind of, of of marking something as deprecated, but uh, you can mark it some somewhere else as deprecated that everybody knows. Oh, this this kind of is deprecated, and you can migrate the data to the new uh, schema version, a step by step, and then maybe some at some point in time remove the old column, for example. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of, of similar techniques that you can apply to object relational mappings and and relational schemas for the database. Isn't there another pr uh, a problem also on the like cultural level? Because um, 
databases I often um, get uh, here this um, this notion that the database is um, uh, is surviving applications and uh, there are more the, the 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 database has a longer lifespan than the application itself mm -hmm. and uh, is therefore more or less carved in stone uh, while the the um, while the application is really soft and and changeable um, mm -hmm. so in, in is there a problem talking um, a DBA into changing the schema just because it's not really convenient anymore? I think it depends on the people working with the database and on the, the let's say, administrators or those really, really working with the database. And there, there are many people out there who are really um, convinced that, that, that developing software in an agile way is, is, a good, is a good idea and is a good way of developing software. And they're really happy with um, having um, changing the schema all the time. In, in the current in the project where I'm currently involved in, we we are changing the schema while we are developing. So not not the production schema, but the schema in, in development. Let's say every two or three days, adding stuff and removing stuff, renaming tables, or whatever. So it's a real it's it's a really maybe a too agile way of of dealing with the with the database, but. Um, it's really it works quite easily with uh, scripts, where you just um, put the changes of the schema into into a SQL script, um, and that's it. And then um, if you if we publish a release, we just collect all these 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 let's say Delta scripts. Um, we we send it to the to the administrator of the database and say, okay, it's a, we will test it in an integration environment and we put it into production for the release, and, and that's it. He's he's happy with it. Maybe he's not happy if he, if he needs to do this every five days uh, working on the production data, but in in our release cycles, it's it's easily manageable. So and those scripts also migrate the the data in the production system. Yes, yes. We okay. we have scripts that migrate the, the the real schema definition and additional scripts that migrate the data. Um, that's that's um one situation. You can think of other situations where these. Um, data migration is not so easily possible on the SQL level. We need some some more logic, and you can even implement some some small batch programs or whatever that, that migrate the data. Or you can think of lazy lazy migration strategies where you implement into your software strategies where where the object relational mapping, for example, is able to to load the data out of the old schema as well as from the new schema. And if it's loaded once from the old schema. And put into the new schema. Uh, it's inside the new schema, and it's from from there on loaded from the new new schema from the new version, and no longer from the old version. So you have this kind of, of lazy migration techniques built into the software, but it makes your software more complicated because you need to have these kind of at least the the loading techniques and the loading mechanisms for many different versions, and uh, it becomes more complicated if you have let's say three or four different schema versions we have all the loading techniques and you need to migrate the data from schema to schema lazily it's it's quite complicated but it might be necessary if you have a real a huge database which you cannot just say okay i i migrate my terabytes of data just uh, in five minutes or whatever so but but you are using scripts instead of this lazy approach yeah in, in we are using project. scripts okay. because we have, a, we have a database with a some gigabytes, but that's um, that's, that's tenable, okay. tenable for for a database. Okay, so um, and I mean another like like point of stability usually is uh, if you have a published API or you have some web services that you offer to to oh, other yes. people uh, that you might even not be aware of who who the actual clients are. So what do you do with that? That's that's really difficult. I think if you have a published API, in contrast to a just public API, if you have a real published API where you do not know your clients, um, so for example, typical uh, if you're implementing frameworks or platforms, um, like for example the Eclipse team does with the Rich Client Platform or the Spring Framework, implementing stuff or whatever. Even if you have a small open source project where you have published API. Um, you really, you really, some sometimes you really 
would like to change this API, but you know if you change this API, you will break your clients. And most of the changes you can think of for a for published API are breaking clients. So it's, it's really, really complicated to change these APIs and it makes you think about refactoring the API twice um, because you somehow think, should I really do this refactoring on the API or should I not? And if you have a, let's say a compatibility um, idea in your mind that you would like to have your published API be compatible and upwards and downwards compatible in the future, um, you just cannot change it at all in the future. And you need to find some, some strategies how to deal with those, those situations. Um, typically, for example, the JDK or, or many libraries, they're doing some kind of deprecation. They deprecate methods or, or classes or whatever parts of the published API and they provide a new API for people to adapt. And they hope that all the clients will adapt to this new API version in the future, that they can skip in some point in the future the, the old deprecated API. It's, it's didn't happen for the JDK yeah, for all the years, yeah. but uh, yeah. <laughs> don't. There's uh, just so many clients, and they do not want to break break the clients. And the Eclipse project, they they have a similar problem because they have a, a huge set of published APIs, and they they ensure a binary compatibility okay. um, all the time for for every version, and it's 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 really complicated to to improve those APIs over time. There exists some techniques and some 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 nice nice ideas how you can can change published APIs in a compatible way, like um, having an, an interface in a published API is a typical pattern, and having a, an abstract implementation for that interface in the published API as well, so that clients can implement um, or can extend the abstract implementation instead of the interface. Then you are able to add, for example, methods to the interface uh, without breaking your clients because you can add the default implementation to the abstract class and the client um, is source and, and binary compatible with it. Uh, it's a one pattern, just one pattern. There exists some, some more patterns, adapter mechanisms, um, um, adding interfaces instead of changing interfaces, um, stuff like that. But it's, it's a real... It's a big problem because if you if you promise backwards compatibility, you're always stuck with this ever-growing system syndrome. You always think of okay, I need to be backward compatible all the time, and I want to change and I want to improve my API, but I need to add API instead of changing it or instead of just making it better. Um, so you add API and you add API, and system gets bigger and bigger over time. It gets more ugly and maybe I think it's better in, at some point in time to just make a cut and change the API in, in, uh, in a breakable way or that you're breaking your clients and that the clients need to adapt to this okay. API. Okay. So so uh, basically the problem is that you get more and more increased complexity and, and at some yeah. time you need, to, you need to say, okay, I'm going to cut that off yeah. and start a new. Yeah, there uh, there are interesting techniques coming up into inside the Eclipse project, into inside the Eclipse uh, IDE, mm -hmm. where you can uh, script your refactorings. So if you if you build a library and you build um, a framework or whatever with a published API, mm -hmm. and you for example, or you rename a method in inside that public API, um, you can script that refactoring and you can um, publish the script, the refactoring script, together with your new version of the API, so that the client is not binary or source compatible, but the client can apply that script automatically on the code. So it, it seems for the client, it seems like you're actually doing the refactoring of the published API right now in the IDE. So the references to that changed method are adapted automatically. And that's a nice, uh, nice way of, of helping the clients to adapt to new versions of the API uh, if you change the API in a breakable way. Okay, and and that relies on uh, the Java refactorings that are built into uh, yeah. the Java ID. Yeah, you can. I, I'm not sure. I think you cannot. You cannot write your those scripts manually. They're just recorded while you 
you are executing the automatic refactorings of the Eclipse IDE. And I think they're all scriptable with the actual miles with the current milestones of uh, 3.3. Yeah. So it's it's not really completely implemented uh, for 3.2, but I think with the milestone two or with milestone one or two, it's it's, it's uh, completed. So so uh, is that going to solve my problems if I have, for example, a WSDL file and some some kind of web service or cross-platform stuff? Mm, no, I don't think so. So if you have a cross cross platform stuff, or if you have a uh, web servers or stuff like that, it's it's you have, you have the same problems. Okay, so um, thanks, Martin, for for talking uh, about large refactorings. Anything else you want to add? Um, no, nothing specific. It was a pleasure for being on this show. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thanks for listening, of course. So hope you enjoy the next episodes as well. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.